Good morning and welcome to this webinar on contract formation hosted by BCL Legal. My name is James Quinn and I'm a solicitor and director in the dispute resolution team of Boyce Turner. Also presenting with me today is my colleague Sophie McDonald, who is a chartered legal executive in our team. Often parties will conduct the process of drawing up a draft contract and negotiating the terms of the contract in a methodical orderly way, exchanging markups of the draft back and forth under cover of correspondence marked subject to contract until the terms of the contract are finalized. Parties may have the benefit of legal advice on this process, either from in-house counsel and possibly also from external lawyers. The party's authorised representatives will then execute the final agreed form of the agreement, following which the parties will begin to perform their respective obligations under the contract. However, contracts are not always concluded in a such a well-ordered fashion, and parties can enter into binding contracts through rapid-fire exchanges of emails or even orally, provided that the elements required to form a binding contract are present. Following quick fire and fraught communications, it may be unclear whether a contract has been entered into, and if so, on what terms. Whether a contract has been concluded may be disputed by the parties. This might be the case, for example, where after the dust has settled, one party may be unhappy with the commercial terms which they may have agreed to, and it may look to step back from any suggestion that a binding agreement has been concluded. In this morning's presentation, we will look at the key principles of contract formation and the elements which must be present in order for there to be a binding contract. As part of this review, we'll look at some case examples dealing with these different elements. We'll also look at the topic of amendment to contracts. Again, whether or not a contract has been amended and if so, on what terms is another area of potential dispute between parties to the contract. For example, if your contract provides that it can be uh, amended only by agreement in writing and signed on behalf of the parties, can the contract be amended simply by an exchange of correspondence or course of dealing? We'll look at this. Sophie and I will speak for about 30 minutes and uh, we may have time for uh, a question or two at the end. So looking first at the formation of contracts, what are the elements which must be present? Well, to start with, agreement must have been reached by the parties, with this principally being by offer and acceptance. But such agreement will not be given binding effect where any of the following apply. First, where the agreement is incomplete. Secondly, where the terms are uncertain or where a condition precedent has not been fulfilled, or where there has been no intention to create legal obligations, or finally, where there is a lack of consideration. And we'll go through these principles in turn. So, starting with offer and acceptance, this is an area which will be familiar to all of us. To refresh on this, an offer can be described as an expression of willingness to contract on specified terms and made with the intention that it is to become binding as soon as it has been accepted by the person to whom it has been addressed. It's important to remember that the courts will generally apply an objective test to determine whether the parties have reached an agreement. In the context of an offer, this objective test is whether it would appear to a reasonable offeree that there had been an intention to be bound on the part of the person making the offer. Therefore, you can be taken to have made a valid offer if your words or conduct would lead a reasonable offeree to think you intended to be bound, even if in fact you didn't. To take one example, Moore versus University College Salford, an offer of a place at the university had been sent out to a student following a clerical mistake. The Court of Appeal said that the unconditional offer apparently made by the university was on the face of it intended to create a legal relationship between the parties and appeared to be an offer capable of acceptance. And this was the case even though the university hadn't intended to make the offer. A practical tip therefore is to give very careful thought to your communications and if you are not intending to make an offer to, to ensure as far as possible it won't be construed objectively as something which you were intending to be bound by. Perhaps in some cases it may be helpful to state expressly that the communication is not intended to be an offer to avoid any doubt on the issue. An exception to the principle that the agreement will be assessed objectively is that the actual state of mind of the offeree will be considered. So if the offeree actually and reasonably believes that the offeror has the requisite intention, the objective test is satisfied. The offeree will be able to rely on the offer even though the offeror did not subjectively have the requisite intention. But on the other hand, the offeree can't accept the offeror's uh, offer where he knows that the offeror's actual subjective intention was not to make a valid offer. So in Covington Marine and Sherman Shipbuilding, the court was asked to rule on whether agreement had been reached in an exchange of correspondence. To work out if agreement had been reached, as we see on the slide, the offeree's actual knowledge of the offeror's intention is a relevant factor. So we see then that where you actually know that the offeror didn't intend to make the offer with intention of being bound, 
and you may not be able to rely on that offer. In contrast, there is an invitation to treat, which, was just, which does not amount to an offer, as there is no intention that it will become binding if accepted by the other party. Examples can include requests for information or preliminary exchanges of information or goods displayed in shops for sale. An invitation to tender to supply goods or provide services will usually be considered as an invitation to treat and not an offer. So then it is the party who responds to the invitation who is making the offer, and it will be for the person who issued the ITT to accept that offer. So looking at the termination of an offer, the first way in which this can happen is by the offer or withdrawing it. Case law has established that the offer can be withdrawn at any time before it has been accepted, and this is so even if any deadline stipulated for acceptance has not yet passed. It's important to remember that this withdrawal must be communicated to the offeree and must be received by him. If you are rejecting an offer, it is advisable to state this clearly so that your position is clear and check carefully that this has been communicated to the other party. Turning then to termination by rejection, an offer will be treated as terminated if it has been rejected by the offeree. It cannot be accepted by the offeree at a later date. This rejection could be an outright rejection of the offer, or it could be a counter offer, which relates to the subject matter of the original offer. It may not always be clear if the communication from the offeree is a rejection or a counter offer, or if it is simply a request for more information while the offer is still being considered. And again, the court will apply an objective to test to decide what was intended. So looking then at the Stevenson case referred to on the slide, the offer was for the sale of iron. The offeree responded asking if they could take delivery over a four-month period, and the court held there that this was meant only as an inquiry and the offeror should have regarded it as such. Care will therefore need to be taken in communications to avoid being taken to have rejected an offer or made a counter-offer. It may be possible, for example, to state expressly that you are considering the offer and that you are simply seeking clarification or more information about the offer. An offer can be terminated through lapse of time. The obvious example is where the offer is expressed to be open for acceptance by a particular deadline. The offer will terminate if the deadline has passed and the offer has not been accepted. Where no deadline has been stipulated, the offer will be open for a reasonable time. And what amounts to a reasonable time will depend on the particular case. When making an offer, it will be preferable, if possible, to place a deadline for acceptance so that the position is clear for all concerned. Similarly, if you are faced with an offer which has no deadline for acceptance, it would be as well to accept the offer promptly in order to minimise the risk that the other party uh, may argue that it has lapsed through the passage of time. An offer may be expressed to be open until the occurrence of a specified event. If that event occurs, then the offer will no longer be open for acceptance. So turning now to acceptance, there will be acceptance where there is a final and unqualified assent to the offer. Once again, when assessing whether there has been valid acceptance, the court will apply an objective test. Therefore, there will be an objective assessment of whether the words or conduct of the offeree will be treated as a valid acceptance. For example, simply acknowledging receipt of an offer document should not con constitute acceptance. Similarly, the party receives an offer to buy goods and responds notifying an intention to make an offer for goods, and this will not be taken as an acceptance of The starting point is that acceptance will need to be notified to the offeror in order to be effective. We see this basic principle stated in the Holwell case on the slide. Under the postal rule, postal acceptance occurs when the letter is posted into the postal system. And as for emails, there haven't been any cases dealing with the question as to when acceptance is treated as having been communicated when sent by email. This could perhaps be when the email is received on the offeror server or when the offeree is able to access it. We'll need to wait for guidance from the courts on this issue as and when it comes up for consideration. Where the offer prescribes that acceptance must be given in a particular way, then acceptance should be given accordingly if it is to be valid. It would be advisable, therefore, to communicate any acceptance as required by the offer in order to avoid any doubt or controversy on the issue. The offeror can waive its original stipulation. However, it would be better to avoid this situation and simply follow the original. It's possible for a party to accept an offer through conduct. Looking at the examples on the slide, where there's been an offer made to purchase goods, that offer can be accepted by the other party supplying those goods. Or where an offer is made to sell goods and the goods are sent to the buyer, 
the offer can be accepted by the buyer using those goods. Or if there has been an offer in the form of a request for services, that offer can be accepted by providing the services. Again, an objective test will be applied to determine whether the acceptance is valid. So it will need to be decided objectively whether the act of acceptance was done with the intention of accepting the offer. So it's important to remember that even if you may not have responded to an offer in writing, perhaps because a final decision on that offer has not yet been taken, by then starting to perform the terms of agreement, such as providing certain goods or services, you may be taken to have accepted the other party's offer. As we saw earlier, it may be that a response to an offer will not amount to an acceptance, but might instead be treated as a counteroffer. Generally, the offeree won't, won't be bound by silence in the face of an offer. There can be exceptions to this. For example, as we've seen earlier, a party's conduct might be taken as amounting to valid acceptance. Depending on the circumstances, it may be advisable to communicate a clear rejection of an offer in order to avoid misunderstanding on the part of the offeror as to whether the offer has been accepted or rejected. So can a contract be formed by exchanges of emails? In Superdrive in Athena, the parties were discussing the potential supply of a new type of product, which followed arrangements made earlier for the supply of a different product, Hydro. As we see on the slide, on the 23rd of May, the Athena employee proposed the terms of sale and supply of the product over a 12-month period. We then see the reply from the Superdrive's employee two days later. Please go ahead with the below. Superdrive began taking deliveries in October 2017, Following slow sales, they informed Athena in April 2018 that further orders were unlikely and no further orders were placed. Athena then claimed loss, losses for the products not taken for the remainder of the 12 month period and brought a claim for the summary judgment. And as we see on the slide, the judge was satisfied that in seeking to apply the objective test to determine the terms of an agreement, the exchange of the emails was as contended by Athena, i.e., it amounted to a binding agreement for the sale of a minimum quantity of products over a 12 month period. So it is therefore perfectly possible to conclude a binding contract by a simple exchange of emails, even if they are written in an informal style, and this should be carefully borne in mind in terms of day-to-day -day operations. It's perfectly possible for the parties to enter into a binding contract orally. In Wells and Devani, the Supreme Court was asked to consider whether a contract had been entered into in an oral conversation between the claimant and the defendant. Mr. Wells had developed a block of flats. He was struggling to sell some of the flats and he was put in contact with an estate agent, Mr. Devani. Mr. Wells and Mr. Devani spoke on the telephone and gave different accounts of that call in the court proceedings. Mr. Devani, Mr. Devani's evidence was that he said that he was an estate agent and that his standard terms were 2% plus VAT. Mr. Wells' position was that Mr. Devani didn't mention commission and gave the impression he was looking to purchase on his own account. The trial judge preferred Mr. Devani's evidence and found that he had been acting as an agent and had informed Mr. Wells of his 2% standard term. Soon after that call, Mr. Devani introduced an organisation to Mr. Wells, which later agreed to buy the flats. Mr. Devani emailed Mr. Wells his written T's and C's and sought the payment of his 2% commission on completion of the sale. And as we see on the slide, the Supreme Court was satisfied that an agreement had been reached in a telephone call and that it was clear that Mr. Devani was to be paid the 2% commission on completion of the sale. As we saw at the beginning of the presentation, an agreement won't be binding if it is incomplete. This will be the case where agreement has been reached on certain terms, but no agreement has been concluded on other important points. Looking at some examples, in Havy and Pratt, a lease agreement didn't specify a commencement date and was therefore held to be incomplete. In CRS and McLaren, the agreement didn't deal with numerous matters of considerable commercial significance to the parties, including ownership of IP rights in the design of a racing car. The position is complicated by the fact that in some cases, the court has found that there have been binding agreements, even where not all details have been included. In the SK Properties case, the court found that there was a binding contract for sale of land, where it did not include a time for completing certain formalities. There, the court held that there was an implied term that the formalities were to be completed within a reasonable time. Since it isn't always clear whether an agreement might later be found to be incomplete, the recommendation would therefore to be ensure as far as possible you give thought to all essential terms so that your contract isn't at risk of being considered as incomplete in the event of a dispute. 
We see the term subject to contract used most frequently in contracts for sale of land, with the agreement not having binding effect until the parties have agreed and executed a formal written document. However, this label of subject to contract is often used in other types of contract where it is envisaged that a formal document will be drawn up and signed. We often see this in without prejudice settlement discussions where the parties will negotiate the key terms of a potential settlement subject to an agreement being entered into for the matter to be settled. Where you do envisage that you will be drawing up a contract document, it is sensible to label your communication subject to contract so that it is clear that you intend to be bound only when a formal document has been prepared and executed. But be aware, if the parties later dispense with the need for a formal contract document, it may be that a contract will come into existence if the parties later go on to reach agreements through their dealing and conduct. So what's the position with less of intent, which might be drawn up ahead of a formal contract document? Well, there's no general rule as to whether or not they will be binding. As we see from the excerpt from the judgment in the Air Studios case on the slide, this will depend on the terms of the document. On a proper construction of the document, is there an intention to enter into a binding contract? The case of Arcadis and AMEC concerned the construction of a building and car park. The defendant was a specialist concrete contractor which engaged the claimant to carry out design works ahead of a wider protocol agreement, which ultimately didn't materialize. There was a dispute as to whether a contract had been entered into. The claimant had sent a letter of instruction for the defendant to carry out the design works. As we see on the slide, the trial judge commented that the letter of instruction had all the hallmarks of a letter of intent commonly used in the construction industry and which are often found to form a simple contract went on to find that the letter of instruction and the responses to it and the carrying out of the works evidenced a binding contract. It is important for the parties to agree the contracts properly on the terms that are clear and as definite as possible, rather than go to the expense and uncertainty of having the courts decide what terms were agreed. This was shown in the case of Scammell, where the parties agreed that the defendant would acquire from the claimant a new motor van on higher purchase terms. The House of Lords found that there was no contract as no particular meaning could be given to the phrase. However, the courts will always try and find a valid contract where possible and attempt to understand what was in the parties' minds. It's usually seen as a last resort for a contract to be void due to uncertainty. In the case of open work, the parties entered into a written agreement whereby open work ran a network of financial advisors and Fort became one of its franchisees. It was agreed that both parties would be entitled to commission from the investment provider following a sale of investment to one of Fort's clients. One of the terms of the contract provided that if the investor withdrew their investment within three years of the investment, that Fort would be obliged to repay a proportion of his commission to Open Work. Open Work commenced proceedings against Fort to recover the payment of substantial commission following the investor selling the investment within seven months of the investment being made. Fort filed a defence and counterclaim in response that open work succeeded on their claim and defeated the entire counterclaim. Fort took the case to the Court of Appeal on the basis that the clawback clause in the contract was uncertain and there had been no evidence that open work had repaid the investment provider. The Court of Appeal found that the parties plainly intended the words of the clawback provision to have some effect and the clause was not too uncertain and held that the judge was fully entitled to reach the decision and the appeal was dismissed. Looking briefly at conditions precedent, a condition precedent is a condition within a contract which must be fulfilled for the contract or certain contract obligations to be valid. The term does not need to be described as a condition precedent, although it would need to appear clear from the outset to enable the benefiting party to rely on that condition. The condition needs to stipulate clearly whether there will be a binding contract until the condition is fulfilled or whether the contract will not be performed until the condition is fulfilled. If the wording is not clear, the court may consider that the term was not a condition. The consequences if a condition is not satisfied are the contract being terminated either immediately or by one party, whether the parties are entitled to extend a time limit to enable the condition to be met, and whether there is a discretion to waive the condition precedent. It is also worth remembering that it is likely that there will also be potential cost consequences if any costs incurred as a result of the condition precedent 
being unfulfilled. Uh, looking at intentions to create legal obligations, there are a number of contracts that although they are supported by consideration, they are not binding as the parties to a contract must intend for the contract to be legally binding. The closest the court can get to establishing whether there was an intention is to apply an objective test and judge the situation by what was said and done and whether a reasonable person would believe the agreement to be legally binding. The law divides agreements into two groups, being social and commercial agreements. Focusing on commercial agreements, the law presumes that the parties do intend to be legally bound unless there is something in the contract which rebuts this presumption. Therefore, in commercial contracts, the burden is on the party who asserts that there was no intention to create a legal relationship and the party must have a strong evidence to rebut this claim. In the 2017 case of Blue and Ashley, it involved Geoffrey Blue, who is an investment banker and who supplied consultancy services to Mike Ashley, the owner of Newcastle United Football Club and the founder of Sports Direct. Mr. Blue and Mr. Ashley were drinking in a pub one evening in January 2013 with three other financial specialists. During the evening, the conversation turned to the share price of Sports Direct. The share price at the time was four pounds per share and Mr. Blue's case was that Mr. Ashley had promised him that if he was able to double the share price to eight pounds per share within three years, he would pay him 15 million pounds. No surprise, in February 2014, the share price rose to this level. Mr. Blue therefore claimed that he was a party to a legally binding contract and sought the reward from Mr. Ashley. Mr. Blue's case was that Mr. Ashley had paid him one million in May 2014, which he believed was a sign that Mr. Ashley did not acknowledge the agreement. Mr. Ashley's case was that the one million had been paid for unconnected reasons. Mr. Ashley denied that any legally binding contract had arisen, bearing in mind a large amount of alcohol was consumed and he did not recall making such an agreement. In any event, even if he had made this suggestion, he would not have been serious. In fact, the other financial specialists described the conversation as banter. The court held that there had been no intention to create legal relations and Mr. Justice Leggett explained in his judgment that there can be circumstances in which a person uses language of offer without expressing a genuine willingness to be bound. He also noted that it is unusual in this day and age for a contract of this alleged value to leave no electronic footprint and that the court will be quick to spot the human capacity for wishful thinking when it sees it. It's also therefore worth remembering that parties who do conduct business in informal settings should make a record of agreements reached which were intended to be legally binding. Finally, looking at consideration, one of the essential ingredients of a simple contract is consideration. Both parties to a contract must provide valuable consideration for the performance of their side of the contract. A contract will not be enforceable unless each party has provided consideration except where a contract is made by a deed. The court, however, will not consider whether the amount of consideration is valuable in terms of economic value, but that it does contain sufficient value. This was shown in the well-known case of Chapel and Nestle, whereby Nestle sold records for one shilling and six pence plus three wrappers. It was held that the wrappers form part of the consideration, even if they were of little value. The wrappers would in fact have amounted to sufficient consideration, even if they were the sole payment for the record. In contrast, in the case of Lipkin and Carpnell, the court held that gaming chips did not constitute consideration. Despite the fact that the member had not paid for them, the court held that they were neither adequate nor sufficient. In the recent Simitob case, the Court of Appeal had to decide whether there was a lack of consideration in a varied agreement between the parties. The parties had entered into a written settlement agreement for payment of 1.5 million by a specified date. There was a clause within the agreement that stipulated that in the event that the defendant failed to make the payment by the due date, he would pay $1,000 per day for each day the total sum remained outstanding as a penalty. The defendant failed to repay the settlement sum on the due date and at a meeting in 2014 the, pair, the parties varied the terms of the agreement 
the claimant agreed to accept the sum of $800,000 in full and final settlement, and the defendant agreed not to raise a defence to the penalty clause. The claimant issued proceedings against the defendant to recover the whole sum due under the original agreement, together with the sums due under the penalty clause. These proceedings were defended on the basis that the claim for interest was void as a penalty and that the settlement agreement had been varied in 2014. The claimant made an application for summary judgment and at this hearing it was found that there was no valid defence to the clause. At a later hearing, the judge gave judgment in favour of the claimant based on the sums due under the variation agreement. The judge considered that the payment of a lesser sum than the amount of the debt due cannot be a satisfaction of the debt, unless there is some added benefit to the creditor. In this case, the judge found that there was an added benefit to the claimant by the defendant foregoing his defence to the penalty clause. The claimant appealed this decision on the basis that there had been no good, good consideration for the variation agreement and that he was entitled to judgment for the full amount outstanding under the original agreement. The appeal was dismissed as there had been no error by the judge in finding that the defendant's agreement to give up his defence on the penalty clause amounted to good consideration for the variation agreement. It is unusual that most commercial contracts are agreed with, him, with both parties undertaking certain obligations, so it is uncommon for lack of consideration to occur. It is also worth remembering that if in any doubt as to whether there is sufficient consideration, put your contract in the form of a deed. So finally, we turn to the issue of amending agreements. The first of the two cases we'll look at dealt with amendments to a contract by exchange of emails. In CNS Associates and Enterprise Insurance, Enterprise provided motor insurance. CNS provided claims handling services to Enterprise under a claims management delegated authority agreement. And one of the questions in the case was whether the agreement had been amended. As we see on the slide, the agreement provided that any variation shall not be affected, effective unless made in writing and signed by or on behalf of each of the parties to this agreement. By an email on 23rd of September 2013, an employee of Enterprise proposed terms on which it would accept different fees under the the employee's name and job title for the company was stated at the bottom of the email. On the 4th of October, an employee of CNS responded by email proposing slightly different terms. Again, his name and job title for the company was stated at the foot of the email. The same enterprise employee responded by email on the 4th of October, uh, accepting those terms. The judge's view was that the purpose of this clause was to ensure that the parties will not be bound by oral agreements or by informal unsigned written documents. However, he considered that it did not go so far as to insist on manuscript signatures, paper documents, or that both party signatures must be on the same document. He saw no reason why emails signed on behalf of both parties should not satisfy the requirements of the clause, provided that the other requirements of contract formation and variation are, are satisfied. He applied a previous course of appeal decision in which it was held that exchanges of emails in which terms were agreed were capable of satisfying the requirements of the statute of frauds, the contract of guarantee must be in writing and signed off by on behalf of the party to be charged. It also held that an electronic signature was likewise sufficient to satisfy the statute. This judgment shows that although a clause might perhaps appear to suggest that it is necessary to create a paper document which needs to be signed on behalf of the parties, an interpretation of such clauses can mean that an agreement can be amended validly by exchange of emails. Finally, then, we'll look at whether an agreement can be amended orally where the contract contains a provision which requires amendments to be made in writing. This point was considered by the Supreme Court in 2018 in the case of Rock Advertising and MWB Business Exchange Centres. MWB operated serviced offices in central London. It entered into a license agreement with Rock Advertising for the use of office premises in Marble Arch. Rock Advertising had fallen behind with its license payments and its sole director proposed a revised payment schedule to MWB's credit controller, which were on less favourable terms than the original agreement. The director and the credit controller had a discussion on the telephone. The director's evidence was that MWB's credit controller had agreed to vary the licence agreement in accordance with his proposed payment schedule. And MWB's credit controller denied this. Her position was that the proposal was part of a continuing negotiation that her boss had rejected it. Later, MWB... Uh, um, locked Rock Advertising out of the premises because of the license fee arrears and terminated the agreement. The trial judge found that there had been an agreement between the director and the credit controller on the revised payment schedule. 
However, he found that the agreement was ineffective as it had been, not been recorded in writing and signed on behalf of the parties as required by the um, relevant clause. The Court of Appeal overturned this decision, holding that the schedule of payments amounted to an agreement to dispense um, with the relevant clause. The case came before the Supreme Court, which held that the agreement to amend the license agreement was ineffective and not binding. The leading judgment was given by Law Assumption, whose opinion was that the law should and does give effect to a contractual provision requiring specified formalities to be observed for a variation. He thought that the Court of Appeals uh, allowing the variation to stand meant that the party's intentions in the license agreement had been overridden. Law Assumption commented that the NOM clauses are commonly included in contracts, and he suggested three reasons for this. First, they prevent attempts to undermine the written agreement by informal means. Secondly, oral discussions can give rise to misunderstandings, and these clause, clauses help to avoid disputes which might otherwise arise. Thirdly, they help companies to police internal rules, restricting the ability to agree variations. Looking at the NOM clause, Lord Sumption commented that parties to an NOM clause have agreed not that oral variations are forbidden, but instead that they will be invalid. The mere fact of agreeing an oral variation is not a contravention of the clause, but that situation would be covered by the clause. The court accepted that if the parties went on to perform the variation, there may be stopper arguments that the parties cannot say that the variation is invalid. This judgment is helpful in providing certainty on the question as to the validity of these clauses. The parties should therefore be mindful that where your contract has such a clause, any amendments will need to be made in accordance with its requirements and that an oral agreement will not be sufficient to amend it. So in conclusion, just then to pick up on a few points. First of all, at the pre-contract stage, it is important to bear in mind that the parties' communications will be generally assessed objectively to determine whether agreement has been reached. If you're not intending to make an offer with the intention of being bound, then try as far as possible to make this clear in your communications. Remember that you may withdraw your offer before it has been accepted by the other party. And if you do so, communicate this withdrawal clearly. Similarly, if you have received an offer with a specified deadline for acceptance, then ensure that your acceptance is communicated ahead of that deadline, and that your communication is received by the other party. Bear in mind that a binding contract can be entered into orally or by exchanges of email. If you envisage that you will be drawing up and signing a formal contract document, label your communication subject to contract. Ensure that you include all important terms and that terms are sufficiently certain and clear. During the currency of the contract, if you have a clause setting out how the amendments has been made, then follow those prescribed steps. So that concludes our presentation this morning. Um, Kerry, do we have any uh, questions that we might be able to fit in very quickly? Hi, James. Thank you. Um, I can confirm there are no questions. OK, thank you. In which case, um, I will say thank you for joining this morning and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.